Meanwhile, I've been shocked by two new revelations about clinics which treated damaged young people who say they're transgender. They had to grow in concern that gender clinics around the world, they're too quick to believe all young people claiming they want to change their gender, first with chemicals, later cutting off their penis or their breasts. The first is an essay by a woman who worked as a case manager for the Washington University Transgender Center. And she said she was horrified eventually to find they were suddenly treating an explosion of girls wanting gender treatment, change gender, who are often autistic or with serious mental health issues. There is absolutely no way that these patients were in the right mental place to be able to make any long-term decisions about their health, let alone um, decisions about gender transitioning as a child. And the same seems true in Australia. A new study of 79 patients at the Children's Hospital at Westmead in New South Wales shows 88% of the children at its gender clinic had at least one comorbid mental health condition. Many were autistic. That said, I've got a friend who transitioned, a very prominent person, you've seen them on the show, uh, and it's worked for them. Now, the second account I read was much more substantial. Extracts from this book, from Britain about its biggest gender clinic that's now being shut down. Time to think the inside story of the collapse of the Tavistock's gender service for children. It's by Hannah Barnes, a BBC investigations producer who joins me now. Hannah Barnes, thank you so much for your time and congratulations having the courage to cover this and so brilliantly. You've interviewed scores of professionals who worked at Tavistock. The most shocking thing for me in your book is how they were suddenly treating so many children who in fact had so many mental health illnesses and traumas, including delusions they were even of another race. What was happening and why were these warning signs ignored? Well, what ultimately happened is that, you know, lots of young people have been let down by the professionals that were there to help them, and not, not just in the clinic, but, you know, in wider society as well. Um, and like you said, Andrew, I've spoken to young people who went through the clinic and have been helped as well, and they're very happy now as as young adults, trans adults. So I'm not saying that it, the clinic didn't help people at all. But as the numbers exploded here in the UK, and I believe they've done that in Australia and in gender clinics around the world, really there just wasn't the time to assess all of these young people properly. And here in the UK, um, we had not only massive increase in referrals and the overall numbers, but a real shift in the young people presenting. So a preponderance of teenage girls who, who didn't have gender difficulties as children, um, who often had other mental health difficulties or who had suffered trauma or even abuse as, as children, um, and who were sometimes living in really chaotic living standards. And, and that wasn't the group for whom the limited but existing evidence base applied to. And so what happened was we had a completely new group of young people, absolutely had gender-related distress, but there was so much else going on besides, and that tended to be overlooked. Yeah, it was interesting that the early woman that I uh, showed before, she was saying at her clinic, they would be presenting some of them, right? Uh, and as you say, there are exceptions that have worked well. They would be presenting with symptoms, other symptoms that the, uh, the, the people treating them didn't believe. They dismissed them, you know, they, uh, these conditions are, are just crazy. But they would believe the one thing they said about gender, I want to change gender. You had the same, you came across the same experience at Tavistock, didn't you? People saying, oh, listen, I'm actually Japanese or Korean. They weren't. That wasn't believed. But obviously the fact that they wanted to change gender, that was. I tell you, it wasn't quite as simple as that. And those cases where someone identified as another race, if you like, were, were very, very small. You know, it, it wasn't common. But I think... What happened, what clinicians have told me, and as you say, I've spoken to dozens, was that everything was channeled through this prism of gender. So other things were overlooked. Um, and and the, the, the clinic itself would say, well, they weren't there to look at those other difficulties. That should have been for our local mental health services here in, in the UK. But frankly, they, they weren't doing it. So all these other issues were ignored. But in those very extreme cases, which were small in number that you mentioned, where a young person might not only identify as another gender but as, a, as another race, yes, it seems extraordinary that, that it would seem appropriate to continue with 
get into transition when that is a sign that someone perhaps is really is, is not very well. Now, Hannah, I was also struck by the fact in your book that more than 80% of the children were also gay or bi. And this raises for me a concern that people like Andrew Sullivan in the US have also raised, a, a gay rights uh, sort of activist there, um, that we're, uh, we may be at the risk, or these clinics may be at the risk of making gay children think they should change their gender rather than accept themselves for what they are. So you might get boys ashamed of liking other boys and thinking, well, in fact, I'll deal with that by saying I'm actually a girl and th that, that's the way out of it. Is that a concern at all with any of the people you spoke to? It was a huge concern with many of the people I spoke to. And I want to stress it wasn't... These, these weren't... I mean, some of them were gay clinicians themselves or bisexual, but by no means all. And, and the vast majority of clinicians I spoke to, even those who were very positive about the service, said that particularly among the girls, but, but also the boys... So many of them were same-sex attracted and prior to their trans identification um, had suffered homophobic bullying, for example. And the fear was, um, and, and nobody was saying that all these young people are gay at all, um, but the fear was that not only... You know, <laughs> that the, all of the old evidence base tends to indicate that, that uh, gender incongruence the, the most likely outcome for those young people would actually be to be gay or bisexual as an adult. All of the old evidence base, flawed as it is, sort of indicated that. And a small number would, would grow up to be trans adults. And some clinicians were just saying, well, th this appears to be lost. And, and the signs that were taken as indications for a young person being trans, they're also the same signs that those young people might grow up to be gay. Um, and so... They were saying, look, look at our own data. Um, I mean, JID, the Gender Identity Development Service, has put very, very limited data out into the public domain about sexuality. But, yeah, of the data we have, um, which is very old now, so the 2012 is, is that 80% statistic that you cite, um, eight, and, and actually approaching 90% for the girls, um, they, they, they identified as either same-sex attracted or, or bisexual. And I use same-sex because, obviously, if you don't identify with your natal gender, then you don't see yourself as gay. But, um, and then in 2015, they came down a bit, st but still very, very high. So those clinicians were saying, look, we're not, si we're not seeing something that isn't there, basically, and this really requires some thought because if applied unthinkingly, then affirming somebody's gender could actually unintentionally be a kind of conversion therapy against gay people. And it, as I say, it wasn't... A, it was, No one was intending to do this. There were not bad intentions, but, but that could be the outcome. Well, it's the most radical conversion therapy you've ever talked to, you've ever seen in your life, involving, in some cases, um, taking, you know, altering their genitalia. I mean, it's just so extraordinary. Hannah Barnes, thank you so much indeed for your time. I urge people to read this book because... The grave risk is that we are mutilating children who need something other than surgery. I repeat, you know, we both know people that for whom this has been a solution, but if we're doing this to children who just need a bit more understanding and other sort of mental health, this is a great crime. Hannah Barnes, thank you so much for your time.